And the AMA goes to Hollywood's Bleeding. Hey guys, it's Posty. I'm gonna try and make this short, but um, you know, a lot of people saying that I don't appreciate hip hop or I'm taking advantage of hip hop. Um, my last hip hop album was fucking hip hop. My next hip hop album is fucking hip hop. I love hip hop. I make hip hop. I want to take this genre, you know, and stretch it so far that people who may not listen to it listen to it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, this was the genesis of this culture. This was the genesis of this music. It was rooted in blackness. And a lot of times, we all know they like to rewrite history. And that when I said, like, historically, white people steal from black culture, like, when you look at hip-hop, hip-hop was, you know, for us, by us. It was black-created and black-owned. Right. And if you're white in hip-hop, you have to contribute to uh, black culture in some sort of fashion. Otherwise, you are simply repeating history by coming in to black culture, using that as a medium to steal and profit for self. It's weird. Are you talking about Post Malone? Uh, no, I mean, I think... Sounds very posty. All right, welcome back, everyone. Here are the questions that I'm going to ask in this week's videos. Are white rappers like Post Malone committing a racial or cultural offense, the offense of cultural appropriation? Or are they committing any offense at all? Is race culture? What's the dividing line between the two? Now I'm gonna ask these questions. They're ultimately for you to answer, maybe even in a research paper at the end of the semester. What I'm gonna do with these questions is something called the Oxford question method. Oxford has, or it used to have, admissions interview questions that are just massive in scope. So a student might be sitting there in a live interview and be asked the question, can archeology span prove or disprove the Bible? The point isn't that there's an answer to the question that they're supposed to know. What the interviewer actually really wanted to see is how the student broke the question down into its component parts, and then how they spoke about those component parts, and especially how they used what they know, even if it's a very little about a particular part of the question, to address those parts of the question. So you parse the question out. What is archaeology? What are its standards of evidence? And what does it mean philosophically to prove or disprove a claim? And what are the claims in the Bible? And is it making any claims of the sort that could be proven or disproven using philosophy's standards, as just stated, by this thing called archaeology with its standards of evidence and its claims to knowledge, as just stated? So you basically move word by word through the question, parsing all the words. So I'm going to ask, what is rap? And what is race? Is it culture? And what would it mean to appropriate culture? Is that even an offense? Then combining all of those together, voila, are white rappers committing a racial or cultural offense, the offense of cultural appropriation? Now I get it, since we're talking about race, black art and social issues, appropriation and authenticity, an obvious question should emerge for you. Why am I, the least hip-hop person on the planet, actually lecturing to you about these issues? Good question. I think of lecturing not as preaching or revealing the truth about a topic, even the truth about a text, but as an opportunity instead to sort of cue up issues for you to decide. So that's what I'm going to do here as well. You've noticed, I think, even when I have some expertise about a text, I simply tell you, look, here are the fault lines in the argument. Here's where people agree and disagree with it. Here's where people disagree about what it could even mean. And here's where people see weaknesses or even falsehoods inside of it. So on this week's topic, all I have is my experience of the world and my experience of these texts. But all I intend to do with these topics is cue up some areas of disagreement, as I always do and then turn to you to make judgments and choices within these debates. And then to inform me, of course, and to inform others in the class as well of what else we could possibly know about these debates 
what else we need to know to really design them. So here we go. Let me get after our Oxford questions, queuing them up sort of one by one. What is rap? What is race? And what is appropriation? And we'll see that there's a hashtag issue at the core of each of these questions, leading to some real disagreements about the answers, leading to some real disagreements that we're gonna to wanna to talk about in class. So what is rap? For the purposes of these videos, I'm gonna talk about rap and hip hop as if they were the same thing. There are meaningful distinctions that people have made and those distinctions could matter a lot, but I'll let you raise those questions in class. Okay, so Collins and Bilga in one of the optional chapters on your syllabus, they say that what defines hip hop or at least what defines it as an intersectional art form is that it is a site of social protest and a form of protest expression. They say on page 116 that hip hop is, like the research agenda that they call intersectionality, they say it's a form of critical inquiry and praxis. Now they admit that rap does seem to emphasize personal identity as they call it, and that in as much as it's about wealth, it can look like it's endorsing what they call neoliberalism, but it's not, they say. They say it's actually challenging everything about liberal individual identity, and they say it's challenging everything about the neoliberal state, about markets and wealth and so forth, using categories of race, class, age, sexuality, and citizenship just like intersectionality is. So they argue on pages 118 to 120 that hip hop was always created by disenfranchised groups entering into the public sphere to protest norms of the wealth focused society around them. Sure, sure, rappers boast about individual identity and money and drug use and et cetera, but only because they know their personal narratives are effective means of conveying their claims of injustice to a larger group. Here, Collins and Bilga are actually making an argument that you might find reminiscent to Iris Marion Young's argument. So drug use might be mentioned, but it's mentioned in order to signal disobedience to authority. They say you can know this is true because if you look around at the youth who rappers are talking to, they reject drug use and they try to control it within their own communities. And Collins and Bilga also argue that hip hop is inherently collective, not individualistic. The themes in the music are always something like this. We are in this together. Your experience is like mine and will only defeat the state that keeps us down if we agree to support each other. But here's one hashtag issue raised by their argument. If you define hip hop in this way, you may necessarily be breaking down at least one claim against appropriation of it as a genre. If rap is really a means of protest expression, and of collective organization among disenfranchised people, then it's inherently open to people of all disenfranchised groups to use as a means, as a tool. In fact, that seems to be exactly what Collins and Bilgo want of it. They talk on 125 to 126 about how South Asians excluded, say, in London, can and should use hip hop. They talk about how Latinos in the United States should, African American women, Muslims excluded in the suburbs of Paris, Aboriginal people excluded in Australia, and so on. They can all use hip hop, they should all use hip hop, like they can all use intersectionality. Of course, there are elements in the hip hop scene that have been less than welcoming towards black female rappers, rappers of other races, non-American rappers, and etc. So we might wonder about Collins and Bilga's explanatory claim that hip hop just is already this intersectional site of protest organization. But their normative argument is that it could be and that it should be used in this way. And as I've said, that makes it not exclusively the domain of black American men. Christopher Smith, you saw in one of your indispensable readings for this week, has a very different understanding of hip hop than that. He sees it less as a protest against neoliberal norms and more as a cry for inclusion within America's wealth obsessed society. So for the first few pages of his article, he focuses on the common hip hop language of representing and of keeping shit real. He says that these two work together in important ways. What's real for the black American artists originally making hip hop in what Smith calls ghettos is 
drugs, crime, poverty, social decay. So to keep shit real is to talk about the distress that black Americans are under in those circumstances. But then they represent for themselves, for their neighborhood, for their group, for their city, for their area code. They represent in order to make claims against that exclusion, Smith says, claims for inclusion. Here I am with my wealth of my own, my cars of my own, my status of my own. See me as someone who's rising above the way too real circumstances that surround me and see how I also fit into the American ethos of wealth and status and see that my community does too. I represent. Smith sums all this up on page 349 when he says, even the most vociferous declarations of difference bear traces of an unspoken inclination towards social inclusion and mainstream recognition. He says, and it's an argument that's reminiscent of structural linguistic explanations of culture. He says that black youth in America making hip hop can't help but use the signs and symbols of the culture around them. That is what makes wealth and status meaningful for them. They are both of and excluded from the American culture of wealth, and they represent individual identity to seek inclusion of a sort, or at least recognition that they are a part of a subculture of their own, equal specifically by American standards of wealth and status to the mainstream culture. He says on page 350, I want to argue that the strategic incorporation of these fragments of dominant culture gives hip hop representation a unique brand of elasticity and contingency that facilitates recognition across socially constructed boundaries of all sorts, even as these dominant codes are resignified in radically different ways. So for him, hip hop is an inherently cultural act, not a culture in and of itself, though perhaps a subculture. It uses, and it therefore strengthens the meaning of words and themes in overall American culture to make a point within that culture. That becomes important for us in the next video. But it also is inherently a culture made up of parts taken from elsewhere. On page 352, he quotes Ralph Ellison making the argument that black Americans, because they were stripped of a homeland and even forcibly intermixed with other races, are inherently a hybrid culture. So Smith says, when Wu-Tang, for instance, uses Kung Fu movies and Chinese words within their world, they're not culturally appropriating, they're doing something that is inherently part of black culture from the start. Smith says they sow cross-pollinated lyrical seeds. In part three of his article, he says that this makes rap inherently multicultural. And because of some early rappers' deep connections to the international drug trade, so he says, Rappers both had knowledge of, and they had influence over Latin America, the Middle East, South Asia, and all of the areas of the world that the international drug trade touches. So the appearance of rap as a style among people all over the world is not, as Collins and Bilgis say, because of the adoption of protest against neoliberal policies all over the world. It's instead because rap had really already absorbed so many elements of other cultures and therefore already had elements of overlap and connection with other cultures. And so folks in those other cultures are just adapting a style which already shows some resemblance to theirs. You see some serious disagreements in the hashtag issue there. But it could be that the problem with explaining hip hop in this way is that it puts different and maybe you might think fewer barriers to appropriation of that art form to the extent that it's a cry by the disadvantaged for recognition by and inclusion in the American culture of wealth, it might actually be a tool available to anyone of any culture and white or black to make the same demands for recognition and inclusion. And then to the extent that it is already multicultural, it would be available to people of other cultures, not just when they are marginalized or excluded, as he argues about African-American men, but because it already fits with their rhythms, their styles, and their culture. So perhaps Donald Trump Jr. could be blamed for wrongly appropriating culture if he rapped. He's white, he's rich, he's never been disenfranchised by society. 
Though, of course, and this is an argument that's going to become important in our next video, he actually, in some sense, is already part of rap. He is part of the rich American ethos of wealth that the rappers, Smith says, are actually emulating. But my point here now is that hip hop becomes, in Smith's story, a tool for any economically excluded person within America, and perhaps any person of any culture who finds some cultural resonance with the form. Okay, so to close this video, let me observe that we've seen from these two sparring definitions of hip hop that we kind of couldn't avoid defining race, culture, and appropriation along the way as well. Oh, it would of course be possible to talk about rap and hip hop without relation to those things, but when you're doing applied political theory, as we are in this class, and you're trying to tease out the parts of a hashtag issue that are relevant to applying some moral or ethical theory, you're inherently looking for certain parts of the issue, the parts that you can focus on using the theory, as we will in the next video. And I'll just remind you of Coulthart's article that we took a look at, where he parses out issues of Anglo-Canadian treatment of First Nations groups in such a way that he boils it down to basically three that are relevant to assess using Marx and Fanon. So we've already speculated a little bit about how hip hop is about race and culture, and a little bit about what theory of appropriation we might use to criticize people who enter into that space. In our next video, we're gonna take a look at all those things in more detail. I'll see you back here.